Welcome to another episode of Hey, I'm Just a Fan. Because that's all I am. I'm just a fan. All right? I'm giving you a fan perspective on different things, music, different genres, hoops, sports. Sometimes the fan perspective is not as good as the professionals. But sometimes the fan perspective is better than professionals. So you never know with this stuff. So in the last episode, I talked about how I wanted to recap Apple's top 100 list, specifically the top 10 albums. Now, what I wanted to do with those top 10 albums was reorder them and how I thought they were the top 10. All right. So I'm going to use their list of top 10 and reorder them. And I listened to every single album in that top 10 recently. Right. Some of these albums I never heard before. Some of these albums I have. And I reordered them to my top 10. Let's get into it. At number 10, I got Frank Ocean's Blonde. Now, Apple's ranking had this at number five. Now, I ain't gonna lie to you. When I saw this, I was like, oh, that's, 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 that's kind of high. I like this particular album, but I'm gonna be real with you. This is not even Frank Ocean's best project. And for them to put this at number five on their list, I was like, yeah, they, they, they bugging right now. But my favorite songs off this album is Pink and White, Solo, and also Solo with the Andre 3K verse. And let me tell you something. Three stacks snapped <laughs> on that verse. Like he was, he left earth. I know he don't put out much music, but every time he drop a verse, it's fire. He don't miss. He takes his time clearly with the music. Now this album is dope, but I'll be real with you. It's not an album that I put on repeat like that. If we're talking Frank Ocean projects, I'm actually putting Channel Orange number one. Multiple fire tracks on this album. Thinking About You, Fertilizer, Sweet Life, Monks, Pyramid, and Pig Matter. And another classic Andre Three Stacks verse on there, too. After that, I will be putting Nostalgia as his next project over Blonde. That, to me, didn't really have any misses like that, either. Nova Kane is still one of my favorite all-time Frank Ocean songs. Number nine on my list, I got Beyonce's Lemonade. Now, this was number 10 on Apple's list. And I get why this is a top 10 album for a lot of women, to be honest. Now, this is the first time I ever heard this album. Now, I heard Formation. I heard another single off there. But this is an album that I wasn't necessarily jumping to listen to. I don't think it was for me like that. So I never dove into it. But on this first listen, the album's pretty good. She opens up with Pray, which is actually a dope-ass song, and is letting you know how this album and the content on this album is about to go. She, she reeled the ladies in immediately. Listening to this album, I realized that a lot of women either feel like they went through something like this or they actually went through something like this, which is why they were able to relate to this album and why it was so important when it dropped. On top of that, this is right after the Beyonce and Jay-Z and Salon's whole elevator incident. So people were hyped. It sold the album. So my favorite songs on this album is actually Pray, Hold Up, Love Drought, Six Inch, and Formation. I'm going to be honest with you. When I was listening to this album, it was a lot of blaming on the man on this. Are we ever going to get an R&B album with the ladies talking about how maybe it was your fault? You know what I mean? Like an album about a bunch of things that you probably didn't do. They either led to your man stepping out or led to him not being happy in a relationship. The name of that album should be called Accountability. <laughs> Let me tell you something, man. 13 women are going to stream that album. But every single man on the planet that's in a relationship will be bumping that album every time they get into an argument with their lady and their lady was wrong. They're going to be cleaning up the house playing the album. The first song off the album going to be called, It's My Fault. <laughs> it's my fault. It's my fault. Uh, yeah. I knew I was wrong. It's my fault. It's my fault. Yeah. Uh. I knew I wasn't right. It's my fault. It's my fault. <laughs> That's a hit. That's a hit right there. And the follow-up smash single will be, I apologize. But the whole time in the song, they're never saying sorry because women don't ever say they're sorry. And the whole song, they're just doing things to show you how they're sorry. I made him a plate. I rubbed his back. I gave him some face. That's all I did. I apologize. But in my mind, because I can't say it live. I can't say it live. <laughs> That's how the songs would go. And they would kill with me. So the Beyonce album is actually a pretty good album. So I, I kind of slip on Lemonade a little bit. Next up, The Beatles, Abbey Road. Number eight on my list. Number three on Apple's list. Yeah. Now, this is considered one of the greatest albums of all time by a lot of people. For me personally, it's not. The Beatles are legendary, and this album was pretty good. 
but it's not an album that I would play consistently back to back on a day when I'm just chilling and I just throw it on. It's not one of those albums for me. Favorite track off the album is Come Together Right Now. I didn't even realize this was their song for a very long time because as a kid, I kept hearing just different renditions of other people doing it. Like, I believe the first time I heard this song was actually probably maybe Tina Turner singing this. Octopus Garden is a pretty good song, too. There's some songs on here, but it's not necessarily an album that I would go back to. But it is the Beatles, and they get a little leeway for being the Beatles. Amy Winehouse, Back to Black, number seven on my list, number eight on the Apple list. Now, this is another album that I never fully listened to in its entirety. I had an ex of mine that would listen to the album, and when I would get in the car with her, I'll hear some songs, but I never heard the album all the way through. But this album is pretty good. Very, very old school, kind of jukeboxy sound. Like you was back in the day in a tavern or a hidden spot, like a jukebox place that somebody had the piano playing. People was dressed up in suits, drinking liquor, smoking cigars. Just a smoky vibe. That's what this album gave to me. And props to Amy Winehouse for writing a lot of these songs. I think it's very difficult, one, to be a songwriter. And honestly, a lot of singers don't write their own tracks. They be having hella people on a team helping them write. Favorite songs off the album. Rehab, of course. Some Unholy War. And He Can Only Hold Her. Let me tell you something. You want to talk about a disrespectful track? <laughs> He Can Only Hold Her is a disrespectful track. Talk about pretty much a relationship that she's in, but she really feeling somebody else even more. And you can't really love her or hold her or deal with her the same way that the other guy can. A lot of people have been in this situation where they like somebody, but they were in love with somebody else. Or they were with somebody and they had some better sex and some better loving on the other side. And it was just like, man, but... You don't you don't do me like that. You don't you don't treat me and hold me and kiss me the way that this person does. Make love to me the way this person does. If you are the person that is not doing that for them, let me tell you something. It hurts. I've been on both sides. I've been that person where I thought I was like, yeah, I'm the dude. <laughs> and apparently they love somebody else a lot more. And then eventually your boy got cheated on. So you can go fuck yourself to the person that did that. You know who you are. But also, Summer Holy War was a pretty dark song, and I feel like it's not about necessarily a person that was at war, for real, for real, and her having his back. I feel like it was somebody that was going through something, maybe drugs, um, a dude of hers that was going through addiction, whatever it was, and she was trying to have that person's back the best way she can. But in that, was that really enough? Like, you're doing all you can, but this person's still doing what they're doing. Let me tell you something. I come from a substance abuse family. And in that, both my parents were addicted to something. One was alcohol, one was drugs. And as children, me and my brother, we was begging them to not, not be on that stuff. And they, they kept doing what they were doing for years. Now, I, I will actually give my dad credit. When he was smoking cigarettes, we asked my dad to stop because, you know, we saw the little thing at school where they'd be putting the lungs up and you have a black lung and a regular lung. But like, look at the lung. And I'm like, Dad, you're going to die from the cigarette smoke, please. We don't want you to die, Dad. Please stop. And he was like, all right. And he legitimately stopped smoking cigarettes cold turkey. Like, it was honestly incredible. I think maybe like the next day or two, he didn't smoke a cigarette ever again. So props to my dad for that because he, he, when he tells that story, he always has kind of like a tear in his eye. And he's very, very proud of that moment. And I'm proud of him for that moment. Um, but he still was on that uh, Irk and Jerk, though. <laughs> he still was on that brown liquor. Next up, Nirvana. Never mind that album. Let me tell you something. This is number six on my list. Number nine on Apples. Now, we all heard Smells Like Teen Spirit. Probably one of the greatest rock songs of all time. Hell, it might even be one of the greatest songs of all time. And I'll be honest with you, that was probably one of the only songs I can for sure remember off that album. I think there's probably one more single off there. But man, listening to this album right here, this mess was dark. Dark. I know what Kurt Cobain did to himself, but I still wasn't expecting this album to go as dark as it did. Multiple tracks on this album that I like. Smells Like Teen Spirit, of course. In Bloom, Come As You Are, Breed. I mean, right out the gate, they was firing off on all cylinders. Lithium, this is a dark-ass song. The beat ain't super dark. It's kind of like lighthearted, but <laughs> this is a dark song lyrically. Polly was another song that was really dark. This song was about Kidnap and S.A. And let me tell you something. Man, Territorial Pissings, another dope, fire, just hard beat, 
that's my type of rock right there. Drain You was another dope song. Lounge Act. The second half of this song turned up. Like, it's my favorite part of the song, the second half. But this this album, man, is, is fire. But Dark, Stay Away was another kind of dope song, too. It was funny how the last lyric of the song was, God is gay. <laughs> that's, that's a wild way to end the song, if you want to be real. Something in a way also I love. This is a song that I probably think I heard, too. I feel like it's in movies somewhere. I, I feel like, I don't know what movie... I heard this song in, I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking of like a football movie, like a, I don't know, <laughs> Varsity Blues, Man, I'm probably wrong, but that song was just creepy, like the beat was just creepy, but I loved it, I don't know what it was, it was just like, it kind of like gave me chills listening to it, like I was like, whew, but this album, damn near top to bottom, I get why this is a top 10 album right here. And the fact that they had this number nine, I, I don't I don't agree with it on their list anyways. At number five, we got Kendrick Lamar, Good Kid, Mad City. Previously, it was number seven. This is one of my all-time favorite albums. Money Trees, Backseat Freestyle, Bitch Don't Kid My Vibe, Mad City, The Art of Peer Pressure, Black Boy Fly, even though it was a bonus track. Honestly, every single song on this album I wasn't a fan of swimming pools like that, but the lyrics behind swimming pool are actually deep as hell. And like I said, they, they started to hit me in the soul a little later on, but I was, wasn't a fan of it sonically at first. And one of my favorite all-time songs on here, even though it's a long-ass song, like seven, eight minutes long, Sing About Me. You want to talk about a song that makes me cry? Let me tell you something, bro. The storytelling on here is some of the greatest storytelling to me in the history of rap. I saw this whole thing transpire the way he rapped it this was low-key a short film how he put it together i still want to see this song strictly as a short film only with you don't even got to put the the lyrics behind it or nothing like that you can make it an actual just short film but damn the visualization that he did in this then you add the skits in between with his parents talking, him getting banged on by people. And that's how it is in L.A. Even though I grew up in the valley out here, we was getting banged on too. And when people bang on you, they don't care where you say you from. It's about what area do you stay in. If you stay in the wrong area, you affiliated now, fam. You fighting. You getting jumped. You possibly getting shot. So Good Kid, Mad City, probably one of my favorite all-time rap albums. And for me personally... Probably one of my all-time favorite albums in general. This is a classic. Did somebody say Domino's? Next on my list, at number four, Prince and the Revolution, Purple Rain. A absolute classic. We know it's a classic. It was number four on Apple's list also, so no movement. This album starts off hot. Let's go crazy. More of my favorites, Computer Blue, When Doves Cry, Darling Nikki. This album was just so damn good. I Will Die For You, I played this song so damn much. And then, of course, one of the greatest songs of all time also, Purple Rain. This song is another song that's kind of hard for me to listen to because it's a song about abuse. And it's a song that I can kind of relate to from the sense of that I saw abuse in my family also. I remember when Prince performed this at the Super Bowl and when he started to play the guitar, they actually had Purple Rain started to come down or it made it look like Purple Rain how they ever did it. And, man, I'll be real with you. I cried, man. I cried when that happened. I'm so upset that I didn't get a chance to go see Prince live. I remember one time he was doing, like, a concert or a bunch of concerts that were only, like, $50. And I wanted to go see him, and I fucking didn't. And I'm very upset about that. And I forgot who this person is, but I want to give a shout-out to Janelle Monae's guitar player, um... He, I think he had Prince's guitar. This is after he passed away. He was playing the guitar for prime time. And when he was playing that guitar, I think Janelle Monet like kind of went to the back to go get dressed. And they let him rock out on that guitar. And I think he ended up going into Purple Rain from prime time. I cried again. One of the greatest moments in concert history that I saw was that moment right there when he was playing Prince's guitar. That was just absolutely fucking incredible. It's a, it's a moment that you wish you can like relive twice. Number three on the list, Lauryn Hill, The Miseducation of Lauryn Hill. Apple had this at number one. And it's not my number one, but I understand how this album right here is a lot of people's number one or greatest album of all time. And for me, it's actually probably hard to fully argue that, especially if you caught this album at a time in your life where it just hits you in a certain way. I'm not going to be to argue you off that. Favorite songs off the album, Lost One, X Factor, To Zion, Doo Wop, Final Hour, When It Hurts So Bad, The Miseducation of Lauryn Hill, Nothing Even Matters, I 
love that damn song. Like, I love every single second of Nothing Giving Matters with D'Angelo. They were perfect together. Per I honestly would say they did a lot more music together, to be honest with you. And you can't forget about Can't Take My Eyes Off of You. Lauren Hill was in her bag. Now, I understand that some people get on her being like, well, how can she be one of the best artists of all time if she's only dropped one album technically? But yeah, she dropped one of the greatest albums <laughs> of all time. On top of that, Lauren Hill was my celebrity crush for a very long fucking time. Natural, beautiful, everything about her, the voice, it, her cadence, I was in love with that woman. Everything is everything. Damn it, this album, I, I get why it was number one. Like I, it's it's I have my reasons why I have the other two in 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 a in the top two, but I 100 percent understand why anybody will argue with this for number one. Matter of fact, my wife and I went to go see this album being played on vinyl at this dope spot. It's a dope spot in LA. I forgot what it's called though. And what they do is they actually have like an album listening party for like just classic albums like The Miseducation of Lauryn Hill and they play the vinyl version, but then they have facts and facts that you may not know that they talk about in between the songs. And you have some wine, you sit there with your partner, or you're just chilling, having a good time, vibing out. You singing with other people there with you when the songs come on, y'all vibing out together. It's one of the dopest experiences that you're gonna get Probably besides a live concert of it. At number two, I got Stevie Wonder, Songs in the Key of Life. Do y'all understand that this man put out an album that's over an hour and 40 plus minutes? And it's heat. Most of the albums on this list ain't longer than 45 minutes or 50 minutes. He dropped damn near a two hour album. And it was fire from top to bottom. Songs that I love on this album. Have a Talk with God. Villa's Ghetto Land, Knock Me Off of My Feet, I Wish, Ordinary Pain. He made a song called Isn't She Lovely. The song is about his daughter. He's blind. He can't even see his daughter. And he talks about how lovely she is. Do you understand <laughs> how incredible that is to make a song about somebody you can't see? He did that on multiple occasions, as a matter of fact, where he can't see you. And he made a song about women or whatever the case may be. But here's the crazy part about it. Even though he was blind. In the songs that he wrote for us to listen to, we can hear and see the things that he's saying in these songs. That's how good of a songwriter Stevie Wonder was, as good of a musician as Stevie Wonder was, piano player, all the fucking above. He was absolutely incredible and does not honestly get enough credit in the music world. People say Stevie's dope, Stevie's a legend. No, you have to put Stevie up there with the MJs and the Princes. And I rarely ever hear people saying that. Even if you go down his catalog, Stevie really ain't missed. If you want to go album for album, he's not really losing out there like that. He put out banger after banger after banger. And he knew how to play instruments. The man was blind speaking on things that he couldn't see, but made you see them better than you can see them by somebody that made a song that could actually see. Does, does, that, does that make sense? So Stevie Wonder, Songs in the Key of Life, number two, well-deserved. They actually had this album number six on there. Who, 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 who again made this list? Which one of you drunk fucks <laughs> had this number six? This should have been a top three album, top five regardless. And that's why me, the fan, is here to fix it. Sometimes we know better than the experts. Number two on my list, baby. And number one on this list, Michael Jackson Thriller. It was number two on the Apple list. I can get why somebody will fight with this in Lauryn Hill, Miss Education of Lauryn Hill. I get it. But for me, this album was just more impactful. Some of my favorite songs on this album, one through nine. <laughs> There's not a song that's bad on this album. Not even just that the songs were great on here. Damn near every song here was a hit. Like a huge hit on this album. And I'm going to be real with you. It get a little bit of extra points because this is still Black MJ. Nose ain't fully done up, done up yet. But yeah, want to be starting some thriller, beat it. Billie Jean, PYT, The Girl Is Mine, Lady Of My Life. Let me tell you something, bro. We got this album on vinyl at the crib. This album is a certified all-time classic. If you skip a song on this album, I'll punch you in the face. But let's talk about it. Who's the big three, huh? An R&B with the pop R&B kind of style. Who's the big three? We always say Michael Jackson. People throw Prince in there. Stevie Wonder's in there, dog. 
Stevie Wonder is big three. If you want to be real, Stevie Wonder might be number one in the big three. Vocally, he's stronger than MJ and Prince. He was putting these songs together, once again, blind. Stevie can also play multiple instruments, blind. So you might not agree with my big three, but who is the big three from your legendary status all-time big three? Who do you have in there? Put your answers in the comment section because I want to know this. I want to know who you have over my big three because I, I feel like my big three is, is solid. It's solidified. And if you agree with my big three, how do you rank them in yours? Now, I understand most of this episode was about music, but I got some other topics that I want to talk about. Nike posted this tweet, and that's it. A week without hoops. Shaking my head. Upside down face emoji. They tweeted this in the middle of the WNBA season. Now, they since deleted the post because I'm sure people was on their ass <laughs> about this. So now back to the question, is the WNBA respected? I think it's starting to get there. It's rapidly getting that respect very quickly in one season. And if you want to be honest, it kind of started last season, in my personal opinion, to where it started to kind of garner that respect again like it did when it first started. Shoot, Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark just went at it for the first time in the WNBA. Now, they had to do a little bit better because the game was on at 9 a.m., that's absolutely ridiculous. Some people don't even wake up for NBA games that early, so y'all wild for putting it that early. But people were still watching, and the fever actually edged out because the Chicago missed a free throw late in the game, so they actually won the game. And it got real chippy out there. This is what I like about the WNBA. They're not afraid to let the players get physical. Like, one of the players from Chicago went up to Caitlin Clark, bumped her, knocked her on her ass. And to be honest with you, stuff was brewing between the two. A lot of trash talking, a lot of physical play between those two particular players. And people try to say, oh, the one girl, she's dirty for doing that. Nah, you ain't going to be running your mouth all game, and I ain't going to get on your ass about it. So the blame ain't fully on her. But she only got a foul for the call. In the NBA, she would have been suspended for, like, 10 games for that. Just shout out to the WNBA. And low-key... I saw Angel Reese out there. She had the Barbie Reeboks on. For the ladies, kind of fire. Then it sent me down a little rabbit hole to actually see some of the, the WNBA signature sneakers from the past and the present. So let's go through some of these. These 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 Cheryl Swoops, the Nike Air Swoops, they're not bad. But they, well, she got seven of these too, seven of these sneakers. These these kind of fly. And Cheryl Swoops was one of my favorite WNBA players back in the day. So, yeah, she deserved that sneaker. The Rebecca Lobos, they, they were cool. The Lisa Leslie's, the Nike Total Air, those are not too bad either. Low key, the Don Staley, the Zoom S5s. <laughs> Wait a second now. <laughs> these these are a fire hoop shoe. Now, this is probably my favorite WNBA player of all time. And she might have had one of the best shoes in the game. <laughs> Low key, this is probably at that time too, competing with some of those men kicks. Shamika Whole Squad's Nike shocks were kind of fired too. Remember, they were calling her the Michael Jordan of women's basketball for a second too. I like Diana Taurasi's sneaker also. She's a goat. Candace Parker's sneaker was pretty dope too, especially with the strap. I mean, you know, yeah, the strap. <laughs> you know, she she out here now. You know what I'm saying? Now, Brianna Stewart's the Puma Stewies. <laughs> these these is fire, bro. These is fire, man. They they kind of like the mellows that have Puma got rocking right now. The all red ones too, low key. <laughs> These is heat. Are people in the NBA rocking the WNBA players' shoes at all? Like, if they're not, that's another way you cross market. That's another way you kind of help out the players, get them some shoe sales, get their face and their name recognition out there because a lot of people love sneakers. The sneaker game is really big, and you can get these sneakers hot in the NBA also. That'll be dope, man. Honestly. These, these Puma Stewies might be the ones that people need to be wearing in the league. These Nike Dale Donnas, too, are, are, are pretty fire. <laughs> these these low-key dope as hell, to be honest with you. Yeah, these is another one that NBA players probably need to be rocking. So I like to see that. I like to see them kind of cross, you know, especially if they're Team Puma anyways. You know, Melo probably rocking the Stewies and back and forth. Maybe they have. I don't know if that's ever been done before. Let me know if it has in the comment section. That might have already been done in the past, but if it hasn't, they should definitely start doing that to actually just help out and boost the love and the respect and the growth of the WNBA. Those are the type of things that will help the league grow. A little bit of hip-hop talk, man. Uh, Eminem just dropped a new track, Houdini. And I think the reviews that has gotten is exactly what Eminem wanted. This right here is classic Eminem first single, quirky, funny, weird beat, saying the most outlandish things about 
rappers about things going on. That's the old Eminem. That's what he used to do. He knew that he was going to spark up controversy with this song, and that's exactly what it did. There were some people out there that were mad about the Meg Thee Stallion line. And, you know, somebody somebody tried to make the correlation that LeBron was, you know, talking about it, and they say, like, LeBron is aligned with all of Meg Thee Stallion's ops. I'm like, <laughs> how did I even put that together? Like, I highly doubt that LeBron is thinking about Meg Thee Stallion, bro. And this is coming from somebody who actually likes Meg Thee Stallion. Like, I like some of her songs, but also, she's an anime fan. So, I definitely rock hard with her. But y'all gotta stop making up y'all own scenarios, man. Some girl said something like, LeBron probably tried to holler at Meg Thee Stallion at some point, And Meg Thee Stallion turned him down and was like, you know, I can't do that because you married to a black queen like Savannah. I'm like, what the fuck are y'all talking about? How did you even pull that out of your ass to even make that? Like... <laughs> Why do y'all want people to just to hate the people that y'all love so much? Like, just making up scenarios. Like I said, I rock a Mega Stallion, but I'm going to be real with you. I was listening to that L.A. Leaker, the baby freestyle, like five times. That nigga was skating over them beats. Not one time when he was rapping on that freestyle, I thought about, man, Meg the Stallion, though. It never came to mind. Shit really don't be that deep for most of us. So stop making that shit that deep for you, man. Y'all be stressing out for other celebrities for no reason. They don't be thinking about y'all, man. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of LeBron, a lot of people are upset that LeBron is giving his son a little bit of nepotism when it comes to getting him into the NBA. So the fuck what? The fact that I saw some black people getting upset that he's showing nepotism. Are y'all serious? Especially if you black. You don't think other older players that were in the league that have children in the league now, whether it's baseball, basketball, football, use some type of nepotism? Of course they did. They legit put them with the best trainers. Some of these trainers were already NFL trainers. Having their children make a good rapport with them so it makes it easier when they get to the league. Yeah, the league in a lot of places is about talent. But sometimes the league is also who the fuck you know. If you link with the right people in the league, you can make the league. Now, you might be out of that bitch in a heartbeat. But if you can get one little contract, you straight. So I'm happy LeBron is using nepotism with his son. Also, I don't think Bronny is as bad as y'all trying to say he is. There are stars in college that were weak as hell when they got to the NBA. There were players that weren't that good in college that became good players and role players in the NBA. Even when Bronny compared himself, he wasn't comparing himself to the superstars in the NBA. He was like, yo, he knows necessarily that he might not be a superstar like that, but he's going to be in the league and he's going to make a name for himself. So salute the Bronny out there. And also, he's actually working hard and getting better at the game. That's my main thing. I'm going to use nepotism in my favor for my child. Especially if they working hard. You think you about to get the job over my child? You out your motherfucking mind. Last but not least, Drake out here with another reference track. Mob Ties. A lot of people love this song, too. It's a lot of people's favorite song from Drake. Here's my thing. Drake has always been a dope artist. Can he be one of the greatest MCs of all time? Never. It's done. It can no longer happen, bro. It's just that simple. If you don't write your own songs, if you don't pin your own songs and lyrics, you cannot be considered one of the best rappers or best MCs. You could be considered one of the best pop artists. You could be considered one of the best artists, but one of the best rappers, the rappers would never fully respect you in that. And I know some people saying, well, Lord knows they come out with a reference track and, 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 and Lemon Pepper Freestyle haven't. Low key, we just waiting right now at this point. But like I said, Drake is great in his way. He's a dope artist. He makes dope songs for people to party to. He's been consistent for over a decade. He gets his props for that. He should continue to get his props for that. And that's the box that he lives in. But when it comes to this MCing, he ain't there, dog. And maybe y'all disagree with me. Let me know in the comment section if you say, nah, man, forget all that. Drake is going to still be a top five, top three MC because we don't care what y'all say. Because the reference track for some of the rap songs haven't come out yet, y'all still have them there. Y'all might have them there, but he's not in mine. So thank y'all again for tuning into another episode of Hey, I'm Just a Fan, man. Man, hit that subscribe button, dog. I'm trying to get these subscribers up. Um, I appreciate everybody that's listening. Every single view I appreciate, man. So until next time.